the very first edition of See You on the Court podcast. I'm your host, Duan Marrero. Joining me this week is the owner of Gym Rats Basketball, Todd Hensley, and the director for the youth division, Jared Quarles. Pleasure to have you guys on the podcast, guys. How's everything? Good. Everything good. good. Everything's good. Um, Todd, Everything's we're going good. to get Todd, we're going to dive into it. Obviously, Jared, this is his first podcast, so I'm extremely honored to have him on. Todd, how did you guys come about with just Jim Rats basketball overall? So Jim Rats started uh, in the early 90s. Uh, the actual business of uh, Jim Rats started in, in around 1994 um, with the run and slam tournament, which I think we're going to talk about here in a little bit. It started there in um, Lafayette, Indiana at Purdue University. Started by my father, Bill Hensley. Um, Two years prior to that, Spies, Gym Rats, Spies, Indy Heat, the actual program um, for teams started from an eighth grade group that I played on in the 91, 92 era. Um, Bill took a group of 10 of us, started a little 14U team, and that gave birth to the Spies Jeans Men, is what we called ourselves at the time. Um, now, Indy Heat, Gym Rats. Um, so, the two entities, the program side and the, the event side of it, started within a couple of years of each other in the early 90s by my father, Bill Hensley. Um, and then the course of about 10 or 12 years um, evolved into what it is today. No, super. I mean, as a player that I was coming up playing with Speed in the Heat at the time, you guys – like paved the way for me and a lot of players that came through the program and me coming up like in Gary, Indiana, looking forward to run and slam, which was one of the top uh, tournaments in the country. How have you saw that tournament just evolve to what it was then and what it is now? Uh, it started with 32 teams um, at wow. Purdue university. Um, my father was a Purdue alum and a, grandmother ran the student union forever so we grew up in Mackey um, so it started in 94 32 teams invite only um, it ended up last year at about 296 teams I think from all over the country so over the course of that period it went from 32 and then you know a couple years later we expanded each division um, in the early 2000s, when Spies Fieldhouse opened up, it went from Mackey Arena into Spies Fieldhouse. And once it came into Fort Wayne and Spies Fieldhouse, we were able to grow it into the, the monster that it is today. Absolutely. Jared, and, I, and I'm going to ask you that same question. How have you saw the run and slam just grow? Because when you were my coach um, coming up with Spies, you were like, this is going to be you guys' only tournament because it's the biggest tournament out of all the tournaments we're going to go to, how have you saw it evolve to what it was then and what it is now? Uh, well, I think something that, that's, that's really unique about uh, the running slam, it's not, it's uh, one of those tournaments that um, it matches, we match the best teams against each other and it's not a, it's not shoe affiliated. Everyone can come. All the best teams can come. We want, we want to uh, see the best competition. Uh, and one of the things that I found out about the tournament early on that I didn't know uh, when it was ran at Purdue, they, they didn't see the teams based off of um, like your wins and losses in, uh, in pool play. They seeded your teams, like you played one day of pool play and then they seeded your teams um, by like three directors. Ty can probably can tell you more about that, but I heard about that. So like after your pool play games, all, all the teams would come together for like two hours and figure out where they had to play instead of like nowadays, you know, you win your two pool games, they seed you out. Back then it was whoever was the best was going to play, period. Wow. I know, Todd, you had – oh, I'm sorry. No, the thought behind that was, right, was early on in the 90s, there weren't the travel team circuit and events that are going on today. There wasn't a ton of them back then. So this event was one of the only events that brought – as Jared mentioned, non-affiliated and shoe teams all in one spot. And it was about matchups at that point. So once pool play was over, everybody advanced. But 
you know, Bill and Gerald would spend, you know, an hour or two at the board, people all over their backs, figuring out where they seated them out to give the best matchups. So the tournament filtered out and, you know, to the top two teams um, in the championship games. A lot of the travel teams today, um, Jared and I were just talking about this the other day, Houston Hoops, Tech, Team Texas, a number of those guys got their shoe deal from the running slam. So a lot of the programs that are around today, top Nike, Adidas sponsored groups, got their their exposure from that event. George Ravon, Bill would bring George in, and a couple, all the scouts were there. They'd see a group that they liked that maybe you know just started on the scene, and a lot of got a lot of them got their sponsorship from that event that they still carry on today. So it's uh, it's still one of the only events because of the shoe circuits and we're a little bit segregated from each other, right? EYBL plays EYBL, Gauntlet plays Gauntlet. That it's, st- it's one of the only remaining events where we can get all of us shoe sponsored guys together and battle it out, you know, in one arena. So. And speaking of shoe deals, Todd, obviously I used to watch the Mike Conley's of the world and Greg Odom's and they were with Reebok. What transitioned to you guys with Nike? So uh, when my father was still alive, he and Sonny were close um, along with Riv and they were able to secure a Reebok sponsorship uh, back when we had Greg and, and, and Mike and Daquan in that group. Um, once Reebok, things kind of shook up there, their company, um, Bill passed in 07. Jared and I took the program together and grew it over the years into what what you see today and a part of that was shifting from Reebok to Nike Chris Rivers who's a close friend of mine is one of my mentors at the time um, when Sonny stepped away he was running the Reebok grassroots and they were transitioning out and um, we have a close friend Wes Grandstaff who ran Team Texas who vouched for us with with coach Raveling at Nike um, consulted with with Riv on it. And he basically said, look, it's a great opportunity. At least got to listen to the conversation. So um, we went out, sat with, with coach Raveling and we've been with Nike ever since. And from just the gym rats program, just being the, the rich program that it is, you guys also sponsor other clubs and put gym rats affiliated with them. Can you speak about some of those teams that you guys do sponsor um, and so forth? Yeah, early on, um, when Jared and I took the program over after Bill's passing, we wanted to put the brand on anyone we could um, that was doing it at a high level with professionalism. Um, so we had a lot of teams. We had, you know, Spies Northwest stars over there, Sam Gates, rest in peace. Um, had a ton of groups all over the state and even some other states. One of the high-end groups that you will – be familiar with is Mocan. Um, when we first got together, Mocan was uh, Matt Suther's director, and at the time Shannon Spradley was helping. They were framing that program up, doing a really good job in the, the St. Louis, Missouri, Kansas City area. Um, so we took them on, sponsored them um, through our own program and deal, called them Speece Mocan. And a couple years later, they were eventually played in the UIBL qualifier under Spies Mocan, got their deal from the qualifier, and they've gone on to win two Peach Jam championships and have some of the best players in the country. So, I mean, we're proud of what we've been able to do for players and families over the years, but also other organizations and programs um, that we've been able to help sponsor and put together. So Jared was instrumental in helping with a lot of those things and us trying to figure out who do we who do we go after? Who do we want part of the umbrella? So, and I think one of those things that that kind of helped us just just like um, Duan, when you were a player, um, you know, some of the guys from like fourth through eighth grade, we didn't always get to see it around the state. So when we started putting these affiliate teams together, like you know, uh, like Speech Northwest, that was the chance that um, again, someone like you, we got to see at a tournament. Uh, because you were with an affiliate team and then it, it kind of opened the door for us to, you know, to, to build relationships with, with high school coaches like Marvin Ray, uh, Sam Gates, BJ Gates was really, uh, really, really helped us up in the Northwest area. 
Um, Bugs now, uh, he's up there kind of, you know, doing his thing too. Uh, Bo Pat, you know, all those guys in your area that help with some of those things. And then, you know, moving down to, to Indy with the, the Sean Teagues and all those, Gary Betts, uh, it, it helped us grow relationships because at the time uh, when we were transitioning over to Nike, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand, like they want to take the teams from, you know, the town or, you know, Fort Wayne or Indianapolis. And when you're competing at that high level, you need, you need your whole state. You know, you need, you, you need everyone around you to be able to compete at the highest level. Um, and again, we were just getting into that. So we were like, man, we got to get um, the best players, you know, the best players that fit together and get those guys to, to jail uh, as soon as possible. And Jerry, what are some of those challenges you face obviously being the program of gym rats, there's other, you know, programs that's out there who's not willing to be in the same tournament as you guys because you guys are gym rats. So what are some of the challenges you guys face? Well, I, and this is something always, you know, they're like, oh, you know, don't break the team up or, um, you know, we've been here together forever and you guys want to take the credit. And it wasn't that. It was that we were able to to offer an opportunity at a, at a larger scale. Um, that helped kids at all levels. So then that was the thought process behind it when we first started. Like myself, the reason I got involved is I never, you know, I always played on that second team or that third team, but then I also got an opportunity to play in college. Now it wasn't the same level as those other guys, but that's what we were trying to develop as in, okay, there's a tier that all these high major guys go and they can, you know, experience playing with other high major guys, but also you got to experience you know, um, the, the Tommies and the Jared Quarles of the world that didn't get to play on the top level, um, there's still an opportunity to go to school. Um, so those were the challenges we faced in, in each community. It wasn't that we were taking uh, someone away from your community. It was that we were giving them opportunity that, that maybe that community couldn't. And, and when they came back to the community, they were able to build themselves up. Again, just kind of like you, when you came, you didn't really want to come to the program at first, um, but it opened your eyes to a lot of different things, traveling, playing against other people, um, and, it, and it gave you another uh, avenue to do some things. Absolutely. And, and Todd, my grind with you guys has helped me evolve to the person I am today, which was going to DePaul and kind of listening to my inner community here where you guys were like, hey, uh, kid, you're mid-major. If you want to excel and go to the next level, you're going to have to go to mid-major. And I think that's where, you know, as a player, we bump heads within our community. But playing for gym rats, you guys basically told me straight forward, and this is what it is. And Jared could co-sign for that when he told me, hey, Dewan, you're going to have to go to JUCO to rebrand yourself. And from there, I was able to excel still at the professional level by listening to you guys. And that first tournament I remember going to EYBL, you said this is the best talent across the nation, EYBL, and, and this will be a league that will be for a very long time. Can you explain that first EYBL session, Todd, that you told us, like, hey, this is the real deal? Yeah, um, one of the things that I'm most proud of with the guys around in the program, um, we keep it real. We're honest with the players and the families. And part of that goes back to my experiences playing. Growing up, I wanted the Division I dream, was able to get a low major Division I scholarship out of high school, went there, and it was, it was a train wreck of a situation. You know, the coach that signed me had resigned two weeks after I signed my letter of intent, came under a new coach. Long story short, had I been a little bit more realistic with myself, and went to some of the NAI schools and the D2 schools that had offered, I think my experience in basketball would have been more positive. Played, it was my level. So I've always taken that experience and how those feelings made me feel over the years and wanted to be able to share that, you know, with players and families. And, and Jared and I talked about that early on. We don't want people to come back to us and say, you lied to us, right? Over, you know, unrealistic expectations leads to disappointment every single time. So where we may lose a kid or, or a family because they think that they're at another level, we feel good about ourselves and understand that we were honest in a case like yourself 
you know, you found that out through the experience and it worked out for you over time. You had to go through it there. It's just part of the growing process, but, but our responsibility as adults and, and helping develop the youth as basketball players and people is we've got to be honest and help you guys find the right fit, right? What's going to, where can you go and be successful? Not just as, um, a player, but also a person on and off the court. And sometimes that's hearing information that may be uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, we've done it a long time. We've got a lot of experience personally as well as professionally that we feel like the advice we're able to give, um, you know, suits the athlete and the family the best, even though it may not be comfortable to hear. No, absolutely. And how did the EYBL come about? that that first league and uh what was your expectations then you saw it now and where it is today well and jared can echo this we were you know we were one of the programs when the eybl created and what they created was a level of competition and professionalism that hadn't been seen anywhere yet on the grassroots landscape right they they formalized it up they framed it up and they they made competing winning in professionalism a huge component of that circuit so you're probably referring to the conversation that we'd always give before the first uibl session that this is business and it is business and that's one of the things that we talk about a lot is that you know when you as a player go to college you know it's a business transaction you are providing services for the scholarship that has dollar value on it and we try to instill that same mindset to our athletes when they go into the UIBL that you know these are programs that have contracts and there's an expectation of performance there and that's the way it is in life in general and that's the way we we treat that the EYBL has helped us um, Jared I think you could probably say this as well I think it's helped us as a program to instill that message and communicate it more to our athletes because of that EYBL product that they have out there. In that first session, you know, it's always the most important one. Kids are nervous. Some of them hadn't played in it before, so they've got to be mentally prepared for that level of com- competition that they're going to see as soon as that ball tips game on. Absolutely, and Jared, this goes to you as well. How do you view the EYBL? Well, I know when we the first one. Um, one of the things that we always used to talk about is, you know, nobody understands the level that you're getting ready to play at. Cause you know, you've been, you know, some of these guys have been in big games. Um, you, you know, you all, you got your rival games in high school and things like that. But when this first started, it was like, okay, it, it's rivals, but you're facing some of the top guys. Like when you look across on that court, yeah, you might be ranked number one in your state, but guess what? Uh, you may look over there and you're going to face number one through five and somebody else. Um, so it was it was just a level of competition that you know everybody wasn't used to on a regular basis like you always get one or two games but when you're talking four games in a weekend um, and you know everybody had that knock about a basketball where oh, okay you're going to play you know there's going to be some blowouts and they're going to be this and then you may play one or two games every game they made every game count um, and that's what was the difference at that level like you, you were going to have to play at your you know the highest level every game you play uh, against every uh, every team, um, and that was hard to kind of tell kids uh, because everyone doesn't play like that all the time. Like, you know, it was a it was a little bit added pressure to say like, look, you know, we got to win. Like this isn't you know, we can't go around and you know play around. We got to um, you know through the week you have to develop. You, you know, you got to train. You got to eat right. You know, it was it, it was. Just, a lot of information, a lot of things that um, that went into the, just the games. And also, uh, one of the things that I had to adjust to was the speed was so fast. You know, a lot of guys say, you know, a lot of coaches, because, uh, I, you know, I, I coach a lot of the teams, a lot of coaches um, didn't understand that the game was so fast. And, and these AAU coaches, which everybody says, oh, you know, you just can't coach AAU. A lot of these guys, uh, most of these guys uh, had resumes, man, that, that you know, um, you know, they've coached at every level. These guys were just grinders, man. Coached at NAI, coached D2, coached assistants, you know, managers. Like, these guys weren't just, you know, um, 
you know, just a, a regular Joe off the street, you know, you know, getting guys together to, to play. These guys like knew what they were doing. Um, so that was a that was a change for guys that, that coached, and, and that's kind of one of the things that we had to switch up in our in our program uh, was we, we we had to build our coaches as well um, as our as our players. So it made us kind of as an evolve as a program to say you know yeah it's not just about the players it's about everyone's development from an administrator development to um, you know to a player development as well. So so everyone had to get back better really quick. Um, the other thing that happened was, you know, guys get injured. And that happened in, in, in your case, Dewan. Uh, we had a couple guys get injured on our 17U team. And um, coach came and said, hey, man, we need a couple of guys. You know, um, you know, you want to move some guys up. We'll figure out, you know, the rest with the team. Um, from a coaching standpoint, man, that, that's hard to deal with. Um, but th then again, for me, it was easy because you guys were getting an opportunity that – no one else could could provide um and and again some some coaches get um attached to their players and say well you know i want to go too and uh, but that opportunity probably changed you guys uh from from a standpoint of you guys knew how hard you had to play for the for the next two years when you're playing in the summertime absolutely and i and i credit todd you know for just the team that we had todd you saw the vision because rafael davis and i uh, we will always talk about how Todd made us move up. And you guys always saw the long ball. And for that, we're forever thankful because we were playing with Deshaun Thomas, who was Mr. Basketball, and went to Ohio State and left their top 10 score in that program and is really doing his thing, you know. And then you set us around the Marcus Teagues of the world. So Rafael and I didn't get it till now that we're adults. So we're forever thankful, and we always share that story within our community. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, talk about, it was Spice, now it's just Indy Heat Gym Rats. What transition that? So the Spice name came from um, Tom Spice and my father were neighbors in Wabash and they were both basketball junkies. Tom's IU fan, Bill was a Purdue fan and they'd go to games a lot. Um, Tom at the time had a retail store in Wabash and he was trying to grow his brand. So we branded the name Speece Jeansman. Tom was known as the Jeansman at the time as well. Um, and then started traveling around a little bit. And as I went off from um, high school into college, my brother was still playing. Bill was still trying to help um, the youth through basketball. And it started to branch off over there in the region by you, Vincent Hart, Carlton Uli Baker, some of those guys, Kenny Lowe played for us way back when. Um, and we did a lot in Gary in that area because that's where my mother's from. And then Bill started to branch off Spice teams in other parts of the state to help more kids. Um, long story short, that went on for a number of years. And um, around 2004 or five, Greg Oden's group, and Mike Connolly's group was introduced to us as the Indy Heat. And we were able to bring them under the umbrella of Spice, and they became the Spice Indy Heat and obviously went on to win a number of big time championships and you know, arguably one of the top five travel teams ever assembled. Um, so that Indy Heat name started to stick and we put it on a couple other teams. And then um, a few years back, we made the decision as an organization and a business to step away from Spice Fieldhouse as a main renter and then um, slowly emerged our brand from Spice, Indy Heat, Spice Gym Rats to Indy Heat Gym Rats and branded those two together. And that's um, where we are right now. And wrapping things up, Todd, where do you think grassroots basketball is headed? It's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think grassroots basketball is going to continue to evolve. Um, I think the circuits will be around for a while. Um, people like to feel part of something. Um, you'll see more and more independent, I think, circuits that have popped up over the years. Um, it's hard to say. I think you're going to see a lot more reliance, um, especially with the current landscape on media platforms, different social media, different live stream platforms to help you know, get more exposure out for the kids and, and, and the families. Um, but 
to be honest, I think you're going to always have youth sports, youth basketball in general, and there'll be another evolution after the circuit. I can't tell you what that looks like right now. And Jared, same question goes for you. Where do you see grassroots basketball headed for the future? Um, you know, I think it's going to be around. Like I said, uh, I do a lot of the younger guys now, um, you know, just helping them kind of kind of get ready for middle school basketball and high school basketball and then, you know, try to teach them some life lessons and, and things like that through basketball as well. So, you know, I, I don't think uh, grassroots basketball is going anywhere. Um, you know, we're going to continue to get better and, and, and be able to do some things and, and keep growing. Absolutely, Jared. And you just mentioned your coaching for the youth, for parents out there that wants to have their child be in the Gym Rats program. How can they reach you or find you? Um, they can find us on uh, our website, um, and and then all of our social media um, puts out all of our tryouts. We do trainings Tuesdays and Thursdays right now. Uh, live on Instagram, um, so you can you can go and get some some training while you're stuck at home. There you guys have it, the one and only Todd Hensley and Jared Quarles. Appreciate you again, guys, for coming on the podcast and giving some insight about who you are and the background behind Jim Rats basketball. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, man.